Okay, so here we are with our workshop moving into module three. Um, we have two alumni with us, which is great. And then Suzanne, Jeremy, Tristan, and Randall are all in English 529 right now, which is my favorite so far class to teach at SNU. So I'm so glad you're in the one that I like best. <laughs> 510 is like just a, you're slugging it out the whole time. So um, moving into module four, we're going to talk about Ah, you have, this is when you're going to do your first full draft of your short story. And in this, that means a full draft. So you have to imagine how it ends. Even if it doesn't end up ending this way, you should have a complete narrative arc in what you submit to me. And of course, if you don't, that means you lose points on narrative arc. So you might as well try to have a complete narrative arc. And I've shown you Freytag's pyramid, but as a reminder, you'll have an inciting incident, rising action, climax, and some kind of resolution. Those are basically the four narrative arc elements that I'll look at. There's much more complex ways to look at it, but to be simple for our first fiction fundamentals class, that's what I'm looking for you to have. <coughs> um, you also have, you're going to be looking at elements of fiction, especially, like I said, narrative arc. And then setting, it's now going to be broken up into two sections. So one will be setting description. And that I think the course designers mean like, what does it look like where you are? Where, what time period are you in? What, you know, what's the context physically and socially? But then the second one is setting sensory. And that's because it's so important to set your readers into the scene with your character tangibly. And so that's when you want to use those five senses. And as I said to, I think everybody on your feedback for the three story ideas, authors are really great at doing sight and sound, but we also need to emphasize taste, touch, and smell. And those are great places to have figurative language, like rhetorical devices, metaphors, you know, something smelled like something, tasted like something, you know, taste, touch, and smell. Is that what I said? Felt like something. And then um, when you use those, it's a wonderful time also, you might try synesthesia where you could say that something tasted loud. It's when you take a sense and apply a different senses uh, definition to it. And it's a great way to shake up your reader, but still actually get into what something's like. And using synesthesia is also figurative language, which is a subset of rhetorical devices. So those are all good things to use. And then they're also going to emphasize dialogue in this next one. And so you have the article, Seven Keys to Writing Good Dialogue. And um, I'm going to insert this in the chat and see if the link holds. Hold on, everyone in meeting. There's no link in that, is there? <laughs> Let me try again. Hyperlink. Okay, and so just with dialogue, a couple things to keep in mind. So if you are writing a story that's almost entirely in your character's head, remember that characters are never as interesting as when they're being juxtaposed against something else, typically another character. When you leave your character alone too long, that can be a death sentence for the story. Now, I know all of you can immediately come up with a bunch of different answers for me where a character is alone for an entire, say, novel. But if you pay attention in those novels, you're going to find, I'm, like, I'm thinking of um, to build a fire, the guy's still got a dog, right? So sometimes your character is in conversation with something like nature, your character can be in conversation with an animal, your character can be in conversation with somebody else in their head, as long as you make it dynamic. So they're not just, you know, because we're all writers, we love to be inside our heads. And we kind of assume that our characters love that too, and that our readers will love reading the insides of people's heads. And it's not so much that way. You really need to have that person kind of get outside of themselves and be tried against things, typically other people, but also nature, animals, things I'm not thinking of right now. You can throw them in the chat if you can think of something I'm not thinking of right now. So, and then again, this, this time in module four, just the same as in module two, when you finish this draft, please be sure you upload it in the five, module five critical peer review immediately. Because otherwise you're losing out on a chance to get feedback from people. 
but it's just an extra step that isn't inherently obvious to you as you're moving into this module. But it, you, the 5-1 the will be open when four is open, which means that you can, um, you can upload it any time that you get it finished. And if you have any trouble with that, if it's not open yet, you can reach out to IT and they'll be able to help you get it in there. But I'm like 97% sure it's open. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for me? Wow. I thought the Saturday after Thanksgiving would not be something. <laughs> I just want to quickly mention that I'm I have to head to work, so I may hop off early off the call. Sure, of course. That's always fine. But thanks for letting me know. Anyone have questions? Oh, I knew I felt funny calling you Adriana because you're just Sunday. It's like this is not right. Anyway. <laughs> it's the name she goes by. So um I'm really excited. After having gone through all the students in both classes, um, ideas for your short stories, I just cannot wait for module four to get done because there's so many exciting story ideas happening. So hopefully, <laughs> so hopefully um, you'll all pan out with all the excitement I have for what you have planned. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so um, this time it's improv writing. So I'm gonna briefly describe because I think Tristan's the only one that was here before, but Josandi and Sarah know how this works. And um, what happens is I'm gonna give you a writing prompt. And this this one's really short. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm gonna throw the prompt in there so you can start thinking about it. And the little rule is if you end up having problems with like getting started writing, just start writing, I don't know what to write. And your brain will get bored enough that it will write, you, you will write. If you can, it's a great idea to write by hand, um, especially for these pressure like six minute writing prompts because it engages both sides of your brain in a way that typing doesn't. Um, but it's okay to type. If you, if you wanna type, that's fine. Um, I certainly do a lot of my drafting for my work on the type, on the, computer because it's just faster so um but it, these especially these prompts it's nice to work by hand to get more creativity out of your brain it's just a way to force that creativity um so with this i will give you this prompt which you see in front of you but this time we're normally i just have you write for six minutes but this time it's called the improv writing prompt and my friend kelly kenner back in rock gave me this and it's so great um, because I'm going to come in like every 15 to 20 seconds and Sarah's going to beat me up if I don't because two times ago <laughs> I forgot to come in. <laughs> anyway, and I'm just going to throw a word at you and your goal is to incorporate that word in what you're writing. And what's so fun about it is your, your writing's going to get jerked off course like what you thought you were going to write. And that's okay. That's what we want to have happen. <clears throat> but let me add that with these writing prompts, all that matters is writing. Even if you don't incorporate the words I throw at you, as long as you're writing something, yay. <laughs> this is just a way to spark your creativity. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, keep writing. Do you have any questions for me? I'm uh, <laughs> trying to decide what book I'm going to use. I forgot to pull one out. I am, a, I am in a journal of the month club type thing. So somebody... <laughs> It's really cool because I get sent literary journals without having to subscribe to all of them. So I'm gonna use my 2021 fall edition of the Prairie Schooner, which looks like this. It's a nice literary magazine and who knows what words we'll come up with when we use this one. And the other thing I should do is set the clock so that I don't go over time. Okay. So I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to say on your marks, get set, right? And when you start to write, I'm going to give you 20 seconds or so to do a piece that starts with, and it can be fiction, it can be autobiography, whatever. Um, I brought you here because, he brought them here because, she brought her here because, whatever you want to start with, make the pronouns whatever you want. Um, but I want you to start with that prompt. And then I'm going to start throwing words at you in 20 seconds. I hope you're ready. On your marks, get set, right.
Your first word is sneezing. It's in the chat, sneezing. Your next word is supplant. Supplant. Like replace something with something else. Your next word is revamped. It's in the chat, revamped. Like, uh, I don't know, remodel something or make something new. Your next word is communist, <laughs> communist. And now it's avalanche. Avalanche. Now it's side stroke, side stroke. <laughs> Your next word is pariah, pariah. Followed by Bog. Bog. Next word is quadrille. Quadrille. If you don't know what it is, you make up how you're using it. We're going to have one more word. Your last word is immovable, and you can take it out in a minute and 10 seconds.
Okay, everybody try to wrap things up. Oh, did anybody get some good writing? <laughs> Interesting, to say the least. <laughs> it is, but it's fun to see what happens when you get sort of derailed, right? I, uh, like you, I mostly type on my computer, so here I am just like frantically. <laughs> I didn't th I didn't think they would, the words would come that fast. So I'm just like, oh gosh, oh gosh. Like, <laughs> yeah, I actually fun. slowed down. I actually did them every 30 seconds. My fingers couldn't my fingers couldn't keep up with the the new or I guess the improv. Yeah. But. Yeah. And we could always do them slower sometime, but I think it's just fine because you think you're going one way and you're like, how do I put pariah in this? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it's I think it's a bit of an exercise in allowing your brain to be more flexible as you're going, you know. So when you're writing and you're like, I have this destination in mind, if your brain offers you anything, just be like, what would happen if I took a side street? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so does anybody want to read what they got? My favorite part. I can read mine. Okay, Randall, we'll start with you. All right. I brought you here because I love you. It may not seem like it, but I know what awaits and it's not pleasant. The world is lost in a chaos, like some insane God is sneezing apocalypse in his ignorance. Would that I could supplant him, revamping reality with a nicer God or with an absence that brings peace instead. The imagined war against the communists is nothing in comparison to the avalanche that comes next. Insanity that will erase all we've known. The psychotic overlord will do the side stroke in his god-sized pool of fire and blood, wheezing for air like an ancient pariah being drowned in a bog. I wish I could tell you more, but my thoughts are infected by him, dancing a quadrille in my skull as my dread beholds the immovable future. Nothing can change what comes next. He is coming. Oh, dang. That's awesome. Everybody, that's, what are your thoughts with Randall's? Randall's take on the improv writing. It's like the beginning of a dystopian type book or movie even. That's really cool. Yeah, I think I I, I noticed a lot of like abstraction in, in the beginning of it that had me like, what is happening? Kind of, you know, trying to pull out from the combination of the improv words and um and then it kind of got like pretty intense at the end and that was uh that was interesting Any yeah, very suspenseful I was first of all very impressed that you were able to put like multiple words in the same sentence that was crazy <laughs> I love that but um it definitely kept you on your toes because you're wondering like okay it doesn't seem like I brought you here because I love you but I do so it's giving very much like misery vibes like kidnapping or something because they love them it was really good yeah my impression was if you had like a team of horses because all my metaphors are horses he had you know four sets of reins coming in maybe six sets of horses and was wrestling those words to do the job for him and when he talked about um the was it the avalanche and then I was like how is he going to put side stroke in here? And he did, right? So I love that we can anticipate by looking in the chat what words coming up and try to think about what he's thinking about. And I love that he was side stroking in a God-sized pool of fire and blood. Like there's something capricious about the side stroke in that context. And one of the things that I did when I hit that page that side stroke was on, I, was, I said, I haven't had an unusual verb yet. I'm going to grab for an unusual verb. And side stroke was, and look what he did with it. So think of the power of unusual word verbs when you're writing. It's definitely good. Thanks, Randall. That was awesome. Thank you. Who's next? Okay. Thanks, for Sandy. Okay. Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I brought you here because you have the mark. She sneezed again. I hadn't realized she'd been sneezing this whole time until I supplanted the powder on the table with a tall glass of water. I was stalling. This plan needs to be revamped. Am I really to kill the girl of my dreams? Of all the flaws she could have, like being a slob or a communist. But no, she had to have the mark. Emotions overcame me like an avalanche, and she flinched when I slammed my hands on the table. Damn it, I yelled. I'm so confused, she said. What is the mark? I don't have the mark. I didn't do anything. One minute, I'm, side I'm in the pool in the middle of a side stroke. The next, you're grabbing me and yelling at me like some kind of social pariah. And then I didn't, ran out of time. <laughs> Cool. You have multiple words in a sentence too, so that was good. What are your thoughts, everybody? <laughs> I love the uh, the specific inclusion of of communist and how it's like of all the flaws you could have been this or communist, but you had to have the mark. Um, that gives me a clear image of that the mark is something pretty bad, at least in like a social context or something like that. Um, so that that stood out to me when you when you read that. I was really waiting to see how you were going to use sod stroke. I really liked the way you put that one in there. <laughs> and it no, made me, one. <laughs> yeah, it made me think that um, the mark had to be something you couldn't see unless you were in a swimsuit because you waited until she was in a pool. So I was like, oh, maybe this mark is somewhere on the body that you have to be pretty undressed to see. And you left us with that tension of the mark, right? We still don't know what it is and what it means. So I need her to find out. Other thoughts? Moving us a little quickly today because there's a lot of us, which is great. Who'd like to go next? I'll I'll go. Okay, Jeremy. Go <clears throat> All right. I brought you here because the cat won't stop staring at me. What do you mean? Here I am trying to read my book, sneezing every 10 seconds, and this cat is trying to supplant my attention by driving his yellow eyes into my soul. Well, he must have some revamped love for his dad. No, I think he's a communist. What? Yeah, that's what it is. How does staring at you make him a communist? While I'm reading the Communist Manifesto, an avalanche of socialist material, and he's not even pretending to sidestroke me. Is he making you feel like a pariah? Whatever he's trying to do, it's bogging me down. I can't pay attention. Oh God, now he's staring at me. Like like a an unmovable quadrille or something. Yeah, that's what he is. Damned cat. awesome okay thoughts from all of you i like that you had some um rhetoric like um like an immovable quadril um that was a good touch being able to add like a different skill level to something being written really quickly and keeping the humor and that was cool i have to say i don't know what a quadril is Oh, that's it's a what made it so much better then, <laughs> right? Because yeah, a quadrille, quadrille, yeah, it can be a dance. Like I think of it as the dances in um, oh, what are those things called? You know, they have right. them in the South all the time. I mean, a quadrille Rainbow. is in like Victorian literature, you know. But uh, what are those ball things that girls coming out balls? I think they dance them at like it, coming out like balls. A Debutante? Debutante balls. That's it. Yeah. And also a quadrille is actually like a horse thing, but it wasn't being used that way in here. But you can have like four, like a a team of horses doing specific moves that are kind of like dressage, but there's four of them doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have done it any of those ways. So an immovable quadrille is such, it's almost like synesthesia. That's what Sarah was getting at. It really is a sophisticated way to put it in your writing because we're suddenly like, oh, it's a frozen dance, you know? It's a Quentin Tarantino moment in your writing. Yeah. Any other thoughts? 
I really like the way you, from the very beginning, I felt like I was watching the Mad, listening to the Mad Hatter argue with his cat. And mm-hmm. it, it really, I like the way you kept that going throughout. It felt like you really had, the, despite the words trying to throw you, it almost kind of worked with the way you approached it. Yeah, I like that your um you, the words it kind of like they weren't like part of the story it like shaped your story and that was really cool and i have to admit that a cat like you can do anything with a cat because they're such mysterious evil little creatures and i'm mm-hmm. a big cat person so when i say that i say that with all the love in my heart <laughs> but mm-hmm. they're evil i mean uh, plotting they're plotting they're not evil Okay, great. Who else would like to go? I think Sarah, were you ready last time? Yeah. Um, I brought you here because I'm concerned that you're in a place of self-harm. Amy, the therapist sneezed, causing her glasses to fly off her head. Once she supplanted her glasses with her, her pen, she stopped scribbling out what she had been adding to the communistic intake form. I'm not suicidal, Cassie rolled her eyes despite the avalanche of tears spilling down her flushed cheeks. Lightly side stroking her arm, the sting of the new cut on her wrist caused her to feel like a pariah. Her mind had become so bogged down, she stopped responding to any questions asked. Amy saw how Cassie's mind was spinning a quadro while her body sunk into the chair, the emotional heaviness making her stance seem immovable. That's as far as I got. I don't... That was great. Thoughts, people. Thoughts. Definitely an emotionally charged scene with some kind of, um, I don't know, non-emotional words, but also like avalanche is an easy one to, not an easy one, but a good one to incorporate into an emotionally charged scene, like the avalanche of tears. A uh, good sensory image there of just like, how how emotional this person is so i like that thank you more thoughts so i love the communistic intake form i thought that was a nice twist on the word communist that was really good and then with the side stroke arm i wasn't even sure if this is what you did with it but as you led into it, I immediately pictured her just wiping her tears with her whole arm. And I think you were actually having her stroke her arm, but I was like so excited by the idea that she was like, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't hang in there very well with you. Um, but I thought those were places you definitely took all the words and were able to use them really effectively in this scene, which always shocks me because everybody's story is different. And look at how these words are, you know, amazingly in here. I'll add that I found sneeze clear in the back of this um, journal. And then I was clear in the front and another, a poem had the word sneezed in it. I thought it's kind of like what we're doing, you know, different content with the same words. I'm reading, I'm reading the Sandy's um, point. Yeah, seamless, agreed. That's in the chat if everybody sees the chat which I don't put in the recording, so I will read it out loud. <laughs> Joe Sandy said, it definitely makes you wonder as to what brought the character to this point and why they're denying that they are suicidal. You did so good with the imagery. I think the words were so seamless. Good. Does anybody else who's been a little bit quiet but still awesomely here want to go? There's no requirement to read, although I will say, this is the lowest threat opportunity you'll ever have to read because we know you only had six minutes to write. You got told what words to put down and we were all in the same like vulnerable position. And as a writer, if you succeed in publishing at some point, you're gonna have to read. Okay, I think I had a pretty long wait there and I didn't get a response. So I think we wanna go on to the next writing prompt. Does that sound right? Okay, this is what's great about this. Take a look at what you wrote and try to pick out your favorite sentence from it. What sentence did you feel turn out the best? And with that favorite sentence, 
Um, you're going to make that the first line of your next writing. And um, it doesn't have to even be the same context. You can take a sentence and then change the entire story if you want, but you're just gonna write for six minutes using that one sentence as your beginning. So. Wait. Um, what? Wait. <laughs> waiting when sarah says she's ready you will start <laughs> sorry go ahead <laughs> okay on your marks get set right
You have a minute, Mark. Wrap things up. Hey, it's forever and it's no time at all. <laughs> Please try to wrap things up. <laughs> Did y'all get stuff? <laughs> Hey, and Jeremy, I know you might have to go to work. So did you want to be the person who goes first this time so that you get a chance to read? I can go first. I, I have a little bit of time, but yeah, I'm happy to go first. Yeah, this is going faster than usual, which I'm kind of happy about because I do have something at 1030. So it's, <clears> it's going fast. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, oh, well, you, there's been how long has Jen been in the waiting room? <laughs> OK, um, so. Jeremy, if you want to go ahead and read while Jen is joining us, that would be great. Yeah, I think I think pulling one of these lines has helped me continue on this sort of um, funny theme. So here we go. <clears throat> Whatever he's trying to do, it's bogging me down. I can't pay attention. This red-haired freshman in the second row is searching for someone, something at the back of the class. His freckles look like a smattering of paint on everything except his nose, where a thick sheen of sunblock is reflecting the fluorescent light from above. The professor is rambling on, and I can't recall a single word in my struggle to figure out why this dude is wearing sunscreen, and why is, isn't he facing forward? I just want to ask the professor to stop his lecture so the whole class can discuss this man's choices. Doesn't he realize I'm trying to learn about the effects of skin cancer? And that was it. <laughs> okay, everybody, what do you think? So the entire class could discuss the man's choices is what Sandy put in the in the chat. Yes, right? Yeah, it was just I think like incredible. Oh, go ahead. Um, I was just thinking that, like, um, I wonder why they're so. This person is so fixated on this one person, and especially like the fact that they're wearing sunscreen. Like, how do you know? Like, is it smeared all over their face? Do they smell it? Like, a lot of questions. Sarah, I think that you have an amazing ability to set the scene. Um, the words you use for imagery, like um, smattering of freckles or like the sheen of re uh, reflection on the fluorescent, like I think that that's really cool to be able to come up with that in such a short period of time. Thank you. Did everybody else picture, and maybe this is just me, I pictured one of those lecture halls, you know, with like the wood and, <laughs> you know, a chalkboard, which should have been at least a whiteboard, right? in the front um, because he could see the person turning around so there had to be some sort of stadium seating so one of the things that we talk about in these um in in these workshops is contingent reality and i learned this term from one of my colleagues at the air force academy when i taught there and it's um tom i don't know if i can remember his last name but vargish tom vargish taught me this term and uh it's we bring all of the realities we've had in our moments to what we're reading. So sometimes you can't even help the way that a reader is going to respond to your writing because, you know, I sat on a lecture hall that looked like that. So I gave you one of my lecture halls, right? So contingent reality is this important engagement that happens with your reader that you can't predict. You can't know what their experiences have been. You just have to try to shape 
their experience and then they're going to fill in the gaps. And so counting on that engagement with your reader is one of the fun parts about writing because you can't control it. And the sooner you learn you can't control everything about your reader's experiences, the better off you'll be because <laughs> you, you kind of give up the desire to control it. Jeremy, I loved that um, the lecture in the in the hall is not going to be about skin cancer. You know, he's probably in, as, as I'm reading a British based <laughs> book right now, he's probably in maths, right? <laughs> But, um, you know, he's like, no, no, I want to know what's up with this redhead with, you know, and then I pictured Spicoli because I'm that old, uh, from fast times at Bridgemont High, because he always had some luck mm -hmm. on his nose when he was in class, even though he was like, maybe he's just high. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jen, welcome. Um, hey. So sorry that we've done both writing prompts, but if you want to go back and try them, they'll be in the recording. And you're being recorded okay. now, which I think it told you when you came in, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. I just want to be sure you knew that. And what we're doing now is reading back what people got in the six minute writing prompt. And the first prompt, I threw words every, well, it became, it became 30 seconds because it was too fast at 20 seconds. And then they picked their favorite sentence from what they wrote in the first one and wrote a new story or extended the story they were working on. So now we're just reading what people got. Okay. Okay. So who's interested in going next? I'll go. Okay, Sarah. Her mind had become so bogged down with all the sugar in her birthday cake. Her first birthday in a new foster home, not knowing if anyone else even knew or cared, she treated herself to actually a mini bunt cake after school. An hour later, she snuck into the foster home, knowing she was really late getting home from school. She heard sobs echoing from the living room. Her seven-year-old foster sister, Brittany, got up and ran, arms outstretched to Cassie. Where have you been? You've ruined it. Brittany's tears left wet spots on Cassie's Adidas hoodie. Slowly, she started to recognize the sweet smell of chocolate cake drifting from the kitchen. Brittany hap took her by the hand and led her to the table. The white frosted cake sat there wishing her a happy birthday. It was Cassie's turn to cry. Oh. Oh. Okay. And I have way too many adverbs. Oh, well, you know what? You're, I mean, you can do that with your editor after six minutes, but you just write for the six minutes. That's most of writing is editing, right? This is your chance later. But yes, thoughts, everybody, on where this went unexpectedly from the first one? I liked the uh, personification of the cake saying that it was welcoming or uh, get, wishing her a happy birthday. I thought that was a cool touch at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Like beyond just the words written on the cake, it had... Because, I mean, okay, so this is a thought I had. Thanks, Randall, for kicking me off. But, you know, we learn something about this foster home just by the presence of that cake and the words on it, right? So personification is great. What else? What do we know about uh, Cassie's expectations from the narrative arc of this little piece? She's expecting her birthday to be forgotten. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. So what's so cool about mm -hmm. this piece and what Jen doesn't know is in the last piece, Cassie was being accused of being suicidal. So this is such an amazing shift because we're having a moment of um, sort of like Cassie's just being Cassie with no expectations because that makes sense because she's been in the foster system. And then she walks into this house and they've remembered and they're celebrating and it's something new for her. So of course she cries, right? And we can pick up on all of that. I know Cassie well, and just Andy knows Cassie pretty well. <laughs> but um, I think that what I said, you could still pick up on from what she wrote, even if I didn't know this character. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so it's really fun to see how much extra meaning can be behind these little movements. Like we know, her buying her own cake 
means she didn't have expectations. And it's interesting that she bought a bunt and they made a chocolate. And I know there's meaning behind that. I'd have to sit and think about that for a bit. Maybe, maybe she doesn't like chocolate. Oh no, Sarah, is that it? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> it's actually her favorite. So for them to have figured it out and no nice. one put thought nice. into it. Yeah, you could almost just put in her favorite somewhere in there and really cinch up what's happening, right? Yeah. Maybe she's found family, Joe Sandy's asking in the um, chat. Yeah, maybe. Although, <laughs> I know what happens, but anyway. Um, so we won't we won't dwell on that. It was a really actually a happy Cassie one, and I'm gonna just revel in that for a little bit. So uh, do, who would like to go next? Sandy, thanks. Um, all that came to me was dialogue. So. Okay. Am I really to kill the girl of my dreams? No, John, but the world will think you did, and yourself. John, yuck, I don't like that one. I'm just trying it out, so what would you like to be called? How about Lord Jonathan III of the Walsington Lords of the Estate? That's long, can you pick a nickname? That is a nickname, but it's too long for a nickname. That's why you'll call me John for short. All right, Lord Jonathan, let's get this show on the road. Wait, but what will she be called? The lady? Yeah, she doesn't need a name. Why not? Because you're gonna kill her. Ooh, I feel like she needs a name. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> I'm wondering who is John talking to? Mm -hmm. Definitely my first question. Other thoughts? I'm also really curious about what's happening here because because you she oh, okay, so John needs to kill this girl. We're not sure why exactly, but then it's like, no, you're not gonna kill her, we're just gonna say you did. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> so that, that was just like I'm just like, where is this going? What's happening? Yeah, so that creates like tension for your readers because we have so many questions. Suzanne wrote in the in the chat, oh, that cliffhanger, and it is, right? This is the problem with suggesting that you write by hand is you don't get nearly as much content. And yeah, Randall wrote, excellent tension builder, well done. And I agree because you, you are having us ask question after question. Who is he talking to? Why is it only gonna look like he killed her and then himself? Is this person going to do the killing? And what will happen in my mind if you name her? Will whoever John's talking to have a harder time killing her? Even though she's somebody, right? Oh, oh, I'm very excited to find out. <laughs> and it's like totally open for some great twists. Yes, yeah. I mean, that story could take us almost anywhere. Thank you. It's good. So we still have Suzanne in the order. Suzanne, Tristan, Randall, and Jamie. Jen, sorry, <laughs> we would have you, but uh, you missed the writing prompt. So, um, is anybody interested in going? I can go. It's okay, kind of short. That's all right. Okay. <clears throat> an emotion of avalanche. Oh, sorry. An avalanche of emotions overtook him, and she took a step back, and then another. What was happening? Her eyes darted to the closed door, then the windows with the closed blinds. The more tears that fell down his cheeks, the smaller the room seemed to get. Listen, I don't know. Can't you just stay for a while? He said between sobs. I really have to, I really have to get back to the office. I have a client, she said. I told you that my dad just died and you want to go back to work? No, I just the sense of trailed off as she tried and failed to formulate a plausible excuse. And that's all I got. Okay, so really quick, I want to say what I thought I heard because you were you reading just a wee bit fast. So I want to see. So there's a main character crying and he asks a woman to stay for a while. And she says, I have to get back to the office. And he says, my dad died. And you want to go back to the office? And then I think you said she's his sister. And she's. No, no, no. no I didn't. I didn't. I actually didn't put a, a relationship between them yet because okay. I, I just. Yeah. 
we ran out of time and I was like, I don't know what else to put. Okay, no, no, this was great. I just want to be sure that, because I thought I heard sister and if it was sister, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and maybe they don't share the same dad. And I mean, it was, you know, there was a lot of possibility there. But even if it's some kind of friendship or some kind of, you know, more intimate relationship than that between these people, the fact that she has to get back to the office because she has clients, already I'm intrigued. What did, what did the rest do you think? I was uh I was pretty captivated by the like opening the setting of the scene with the closed door and the closed blinds. I first imagined it from the outside of a house or from the outside of something. Um, but then obviously as you go on, you're inside. So um I just like that that was what caught my attention was trying to figure out, you know, from Im immediately from the beginning of like where this this narrator is. Um so that was cool. You could feel the like pull and push between the two, like the main person wanting that person to stay, and the other person like seeming like almost casually saying, "No, I have to go." And um, and then like Dr. Max had said, like you kind of bring in your own experience and such. I'm reading this other book where when you just said like I'm going to meet another client, like it made me think that she is a prostitute maybe um, because then like the blinds are closed the doors closed so it's like this secret but I have no idea what that if that's what you were going for but that's where my mind went I was kind of wondering whether this second character has some kind of like big secret um like I thought you were leading towards like whatever the secret is, is so big that it's more important than this person's like father dying because I I couldn't really hear, but I think at the end you were saying like, um, I needed to think of a better excuse or something like that. So um, yeah, that felt like you were really building up like the tension for like whatever it is that this person is actually leaving to do. Randall added in the chat, character emotions being juxtaposed build a quick and interesting bit of conflict. And I agree, right? So conflict, tension, those are the things, those are the, the magic of stories, right? Anybody else have any other thoughts? Yeah, I think you should get, keep going, Tristan. That's really interesting. Okay, Suzanne, Randall, Jamie, anybody want to read what you got? I can go. Okay, thanks, Randall. I wish I could tell you more, but my thoughts are infected by him, dancing a quadrille in my skull as my dread beholds the immovable future. Have you seen what lives at the end of the tunnel? I've always been afraid to get too close. If they see you, then it's over. What do you mean, she asked. I think we all arrive in these places, places like this one. I patted the fleshy stone, trying not to breathe, knowing the smell of must and awful and the acrid burn of smoke would assail me once more. The walls of the cavern are honeycombed, like some infernal beehive. I can hear them screaming when they're taken. She shivered in spite of the godless heat. What are they, she asked. Better to reign below than to serve above. What does that mean? I heard talons echoing down the wandering tunnel. A shadow capering in the gloom as something large drew closer. I don't know, I said. It's a conflict there. What are your thoughts, everybody? Dr. Sandy says, your writing is almost lyrical, honeycombed like some infernal beehive. Wow, the imagery. And Suzanne agrees. She loves the imagery. Jen, were you going to say something? And, um, I know. I like that little connection that the we've re heard um, from Paradise Lost. Better to, you know, reign in hell than serve in heaven. Yeah. And Jeremy, fleshy stone. That was my favorite part. Yeah, my too. stone is fleshy. Oh, I was going to say, too, picking the quadril in the skull like choosing the word skull instead of like head, mind, thoughts, that adds a different nuance that I thought was good. Yeah, it takes away the flesh almost there. 
and then he puts it on the stone later and he opened up with the he he something about his thoughts were being controlled or he was speaking through him or you know there's another something awful inside that skull and then he he has that line better to reign below than to serve above and when she asks what he means he says i don't know and we know that there is sort of more than one consciousness manipulating what he's saying and it's you know the possibilities of that are endless right <laughs> very excited about the story i agree that it's lyrical um that you have you have not only really good setting but setting that that evokes what I think all of us recognize as some form of a hell. You use the word awful, the I think it's the O F F A L awful, which yes. you know, am I right? Yes. Great. So that I mean that is that uh, all you needed was some sulfur and we would have been right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, for me, you know, I had a glowing, flickering red, you know, um, what are those stones that have the pox in them? You know, they're kind of porous that kind of stone and honeycombs. I mean, I brought all my contingent reality to what you wrote is a really good setting. But also when he describes the end of a tunnel that he's been afraid to get too close to, then I wonder, you know, is this something mental for him? And is who he's talking to not in the actual same setting or have they actually transported somewhere together through a tunnel? Like there's still a lot of questions. And as you open a story, that's a great way to have us as readers to keep reading and find out, you know, what is the context? Is is this real? You know, and get settled into it. That's good. It's fun to hear. Suzanne or Jamie, do either of you want to read what you got? Again, no pressure. You don't have to. Um, I can take a stab at it. Awesome. Thanks, <laughs> Suzanne. Um, okay. Lydia was an immovable object, and she would kill her best friend. Maybe not in the most literal sense. Possibly. She was pretty annoying. Maybe she would kill her with kindness. She has heard that it is the best way to change someone's outlook on life. Or at least that's what the magazine at the checkout stand told her. Maybe she should be the change needed to change the world. She should journal. Reflect more. Reflecting is what got her into this mess. Reflecting on her life on her relationships, and realizing how much better she was at everything, reflecting how Emily was so fucking stupid and that if she were to die, the world would be a much more peaceful place. Her reflection made her taste like hate. Yeah, I will be the change that needs to happen, she decided. Emily must die. Bye. Did you say taste like hate? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Loved it. Synesthesia right there. Nice. Okay. I love the uh, I love this the switch, like the immediate switch from I should reflect more to reflecting <laughs> what got me into this mess. I think that it gives a really great depiction of this battle that's going on uh, inside this person's head of like, you know, thinking one thought, but then you know, quickly transitioning to something else and like not being able to know which is the best thing or the right thing that was that was interesting oh thank you oh. sandy asked if you've ever read vicious by d e schwab it's what your writing made her think of i have not but i will absolutely add it to my list it's really good but it, it just kind of explores um like there are these guys and they figure out a way to like have like a near death experience and it gives them like um like superpowers and a lot of what the book like um explores is like people who are technically like villains like they they kill people and things like that but to themselves they think they're doing these bad things for like the greater good and that's kind of like what i was like wondering like this person thinks that killing emily will make the world like more peaceful um, so that's that's where my brain went. No, I love it. Yeah, I'm absolutely adding that to my list. Did you all pick up on what it told us about the character narrating when she said, at least that's what the magazine at the checkout stand said? And what do we know about her now? Uh, 
Uh, she does What's not. Mean girl. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who said she's a mean girl? Me. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Suzanne? Oh, yep. Yeah. She doesn't actually believe what what it's like saying she's like no like it's just like an inconvenience that I see on my day-to-day life yeah so I mean we we especially as writers who might be the people who actually fill these these magazines (laughs) we know how many platitudes are expected in them that we're like kill them with kindness we'll change the world (laughs) and then she's like you know what reflecting is what got me in this trouble and you can watch this character transition just in this short six minute writing from maybe I'll kill her with kindness to she's so fucking stupid. Like she goes from this <laughs> sweet attitude to swearing and she's like, nope, I definitely have to kill her. <laughs> I can't wait to see where this is going. <laughs> I mean, funny in a tense way, funny in a, yeah. <laughs> she's a, she's a complex character for us already just from these comments you know we see her paying attention to magazines maybe she could be a sweet person and she switches on us just in what probably 10 sentences it's pretty cool i think to using a technique where you're starting a few sentences in a row with re- like reflecting on or um, the list technique adds character to it yes it keeps bringing you back to this is what i'm going through or yeah, um, one of the few times that repetition like that is actually useful and acceptable, right? Yeah, using a list like that. That's great. Well, um, this was amazing. <laughs> it's one of the best sessions we've had in a while. I'm so glad that all of you could come. Um, again, as a reminder for everybody who's in 529 right now, when you get done with your draft, which should be no more than 2,500 words ever in this class, but I think it can be no less than 1500. And the draft should be a complete story. And when you get done with it, please also post it in the 5-1 critical peer review space whenever you finish it, as early as you finish it, as early as you post it in module four, be sure it's in module five, because there were a lot of people who didn't make that transition to module two. And also, I know you you all do because you're here, but keep checking your email because if you do forget something, I send out a reminder. Um, and if you get my email, you'll post it, right? <laughs> it's just, it's been a tough week because it's Thanksgiving week and I don't think anybody's checking. It's been too bad because a bunch of people are missing out on all of your feedback on whether or not they should have a, you know, which of the three story ideas they should choose. Okay, any thoughts before we go? Questions about dialogue, questions about class, questions about writing, anything? Yes, just Andy said, thank you everyone for sharing. And I agree, it's so fascinating to hear everybody write. It seems like there's not any questions, okay. Well, I'm glad you all could show up on this Saturday after Thanksgiving. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, this was definitely yeah. fun. I, I enjoyed it. I'll be holding it in two more weeks, and we'll have a different two two different prompts in two more weeks. Okay, so I hope you can make it then. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great weekend. Bye. Well, bye. Bye.